hush that comes into a room. <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, welcome to Thinking Big with Jack Dorsey. My name's Emma Jones, founder of Enterprise Nation. Uh, lovely to see uh, so many tech and small business retail looking people in the audience this evening. Uh, she will go mad, but I am going to point somebody out who I met earlier this evening, uh, not to go into too much detail. I met her in the Ladies' Loos, and uh, I said to this young lady, um, are you here to see someone tonight? She said, yes, I am. I said, who are you here to see? She said, I'm here to see Jack. I said, how old are you? She said, I'm six. So Adana, I'm really sorry, stand up. <laughs> this is like the youngest person I think we've ever had at a business event. So Adana did not know I was gonna make her come up here. Adana, when I said to you in the next door room, what do you do in your mum's business? What's your role? What did you say? Um, we do soup. And what's your role in the company? Um, I'm the CEO. <laughs> <laughs> that deserves a round of applause. Good girl. You can go back now. I love that. Uh, a six-year-old CEO, we definitely start them young in Britain. Uh, so you are going to hear from an amazing CEO this evening. He will require a little introduction, uh, but I will introduce him later. Uh, we've been working with Square for a couple of years at Enterprise Nation. And I have to say, I do think I'm not just saying this because we have us at Square event, uh, but Square is an amazing company in terms of how it enables small businesses to sell more and get paid on time. And I know there's a few journalists in the room. Peter Evans is here for the Sunday Times. Natasha's here for the Telegraph. And if there's one thing they report on all the time that small businesses are saying is I like, want more sales and I desperately want to get paid promptly. So Square enables that to happen. We've been working together up and down the land in terms of helping small businesses do that. And uh, this time we a week ago, we opened a shop together. So we opened a shop called Clicks and Mortar. Great to see Matthew Hopkinson here, who is a high street expert from across the UK. Uh, we're going to be opening 10 shops and filling them with online sellers who get an opportunity to test physical retail. And Matthew is going to be researching to say, is that beneficial for small businesses? And critically, is that beneficial for the high street? Uh, so tonight is about meeting some square sellers. Uh, you'll hear from them how they're growing their business, how they're feeling about business. And then I will chat to Jack uh, for about half an hour on how he started and is growing Square. Uh, and you probably know that he runs two formidable businesses, so I am definitely going to be asking him about his time management in terms of how he goes about doing that. Uh, but Kate McCutcheon is going to chair a Square seller panel. Uh, and once we've had that, we will have drinks at seven o'clock. And you probably know there's drinks happening all across this town tonight because it's London Tech Week. Uh, is there anyone here from London Tech Week? Scream if you are. Oh, oh, that was a very quiet scream. Prue, lovely to see you. Lovely. Maybe do a little scream. <laughs> Again, I keep on feeling that I should say to Jack because he's American. So that is a British enthusiasm. <laughs> that is as good as we get. Uh, very. In fact, it does feel as if we are in these hallowed halls. Uh, how conservative we are, but uh, getting much more entrepreneurial. But it is London Tech Week, so there's things going on across this city. And I have to say, it was wonderfully positive this morning to wake up to a Times headline. I don't know if Hurley is here from the Times, but the Times had a headline on its front page today uh, saying that the UK is the top in Europe, the top place to grow a unicorn business. And I don't know about the rest of you, but it was so nice to wake up and not see Brexit and Prime Minister content lines, but to actually see something really positive about our tech ecosystem and our economy. So I hope this session is as positive as that headline was this morning. And to kick us off, because one of my jobs this evening is to keep us to time, uh, I'm going to invite the lovely Kate McCutcheon, and she's going to introduce her Square Sellers for the panel. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the excellent Kate McCutcheon, Head of Marketing for Square. Come on up. Everyone, come on up. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Emma, for that wonderful introduction. Not sure if I can follow that, but I'll do the best that I can. Um, I want to welcome you all today to Thinking Big for Small Business. I'm really excited to be joined tonight by three small business owners and square sellers who are going to talk to you about their experiences in starting, running, and growing their businesses here in the UK. Uh, but first, I want to big, give a big thank you to both Emma and the entire Enterprise Nation team. As she said, we've been partnering with them for the last two years since we've been here in the UK. And 
you know, they have been an incredible partner to us, and I'm really excited about the things that are going to come. Uh, but I also want to introduce our report just launched today, hot off the press, also called Thinking Big for Small Business. And this was a look at uh, the opportunities and challenges that business owners in the UK face, one of whom is Ted, who's joined us today, as well as some recommendations about how business and policymakers can partner to really help micro businesses thrive. I'm excited instead to talk with you in person, all three of you, about the experiences that you've had in starting, running, and growing your businesses here. So I want to just introduce our panel. We have Mahawa, who's the founder but not CEO of Soap Connoisseur. <laughs> we have Caroline, who is the co-founder of Bisous des Madeleines. And we have Ted, who is the founder of Sweeney Ted Barbershop from Hollywell. So let's give everyone a warm welcome. And I just want to look for David, who's going to keep me on time to make sure that, there we go, to make sure that I give you all time to ask questions at the end. So um, first, I'd love for you all to introduce yourselves and a little bit about your business. Uh, do you want to start, Mahawa? Yeah, so, oh, hello. <laughs> My name is uh, Mahawa. I'm the founder of The Soap Connoisseur, and we are a specialist organic toiletry company. We're a small-scale manufacturer. We manufacture soaps and really body care products, yeah. So yeah, we, we revolutionize your bath then, yes. Excellent, and Caroline? I'm Caroline, I'm the co-founder of Bisous les Madeleines. Um, we are what we can call an e-bakery. Um, we are specialized in the famous uh, French cake, uh, the Madeleine. Um, we only use um, natural products, no artificial, um, no artificial colors or flavors, only natural. We bake everything, everything fresh. Um, and um, we are very proud to be the, the first fine bakery to ship UK-wide. And I'm Ted Palmer, owner of Sweeney Ted's Barbers in the little town of Hollywell in North Wales. And are you all natural ingredients as well? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. That's what I like to hear. Well, from toiletries to haircut to baking, you have three very different businesses that I think came about in very different ways. So I'd love to hear a little bit about how did the, how did the idea for your business come? Was it uh, something that you decided to dip your toe in the water and do it on the side? Or did you uh, start it, you know, hit the ground running and, and just run with it? <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I, I was on maternity leave and my daughter had skin problems. That was actually how I started. Um, so it was just really researching, looking for other alternatives for her skin. And then I stumbled on soap making. I just never knew you could actually make it for yourself. Um, and the idea just stuck. And I remember I made my first bar. Um, so natural soap goes through a curing process. That's what makes it natural. Um, so, and we waited, we waited for the four weeks. And I remember, and then after we used it, I bathed her and her skin looked quite good. And then I tried it on myself. I just thought, I have a product. <laughs> Everybody baths, right? So, and the journey just started from there. Um, and what made me, I was actually on um, income support. So I was unemployed at the time. Um, and I was on income support job seekers. And I thought, I'm not gonna stay on this. Um, so I took the leap from there and actually went forward with um, starting it as a business. Um, I didn't know anything. I was very like trigger happy just in terms of like, I'm gonna sell so many soaps, I'm gonna make so much money. And then six months came in and like, oh, I really need to think of what I'm gonna do as a business. But yeah, that's the short end of how it started. Yeah. Fantastic. Ted, where did Sweeney Ted's come from? <laughs> um, when I left the military back in 1976, which is strange because I'm only 27, but there you go. <laughs> when I left the military back in 76, I was in a bit of a limbo. It was like um, leaving school for the first time, but you're a bit older. When you leave school at 16 or 15, you're full of whatever, get up, get up and go. But when you're a little bit older, it's a little bit harder. So I tried a few different things, mechanic in building. It wasn't for me, I didn't like going home dirty. <laughs> so, what can I do that's clean and, and at the time I was caught in the girl who was doing a hairdressing course and I thought oh there's a plan for the future so I enrolled in the barber's course unfortunately we parted ways and, but I still went on and did the barber's course and then I came back I had a little go at a business um, which didn't last very long because you're naive um, and then I went and worked for somebody else for numerous years and then decided I should be doing this for myself and 
I did that about 11, 12 years ago, and I'm, here I am today. And Caroline Bizule et Madeleine was a, a merger, actually. Yeah, it was a merger between two um, bakeries. Uh, actually, I started my career as a, a marketing manager in, a, in the asset management industries. I spent eight, nine years uh, working first in Paris, then in London, and I always wanted to, to launch my business. I was looking for the right idea. Um, when I had the idea to launch my e-bakery, um, it took um, maybe um, eight to nine months between the, the time of the ID and the, the time I launched the, the business and I left um, my full-time job after six months maybe. Um, so uh, my business was an e-bakery uh, specialized in another uh, French fine cake. Um, I, um, I think I did something well for all the logistic, but I think the range was not so great. So I was looking at what was, was doing um, uh, Ellen, my um, partner and business partner, my business partner, and um, she, she launched uh, in 2015 a bakery specialized in these fine madeleines with um, a huge, huge range of Madeleines with it's a very versatile product, very high quality product. And uh, so I approached her um, 14, 18 months ago, and we decided to work on the merger to keep, um, to take the, the best of both businesses. Uh, I mean, the logistic on one side and the, the range on the other one. And we relaunched uh, Bizouli Madeleine. Um, in December, six, seven months ago, uh, with a new e-shop and this ability to ship UK-wide. Um, I think for Ellen, it was already the idea to launch this kind of business because actually she, um, she was baking Madeleine with her grandfather when she was a child. Wow. And the recipe of our original Madeleine is actually the recipe that uh, her uh, grandfather passed to her. So this is um, something I think she had always in mind. Yeah. Fantastic. A marriage of logistics and really good baking. Having had them in the office, they're excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, and how did you know it was time to quit your job? You said you did it sort of on the side for the first six months. What, what made you decide actually now is uh, the time? It, it was the time because it was a full, I had a full-time job and I needed to to, to, I needed more time to develop the business, to talk to person, and I, I, it was during the time I was in my office. So I had to, uh, to okay, I have to go. So I, if I want to, to, if I want to move forward, I have to quit my job and and um, spend uh, most of my my time on the development of this new idea. Actually, so that's why I decided to, to, to stop. Yeah. Fantastic. And. Mahal, we were just talking about this in the back, that you, you know, sort of started with a small local and niche product, but you're now running um, workshops where people can make their own. You're doing international exhibitions, <laughs> doing speaking engagements. You're, you know, sort of really grown in a lot of different ways in a short period of time. How, as you've grown, have you adjusted your approach and thought about your prioritization between the different ways that you can take your business? For the question. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just wondering, <laughs> as you're balancing sort of your the the core soap making business, yeah. the workshops that yeah. you're running, the other parts that you're thinking about, how do you decide uh, where to spend your time and to prioritize with all of those different things? Um, what's bringing in more <coughs> revenue um, at the time? Um, so, for example, the the core products like they they're part of everything. So even with the workshops, we'll have the products there for people. Um, to be able to buy them, this is going to make me fall. So yeah, um, to be able to buy. So the core, pro the products are like the core part of the business anyway, but and everything else is just a way of getting those products out there and what we do. So the workshops will attach like products along so that people can buy on the day, um, or the events that we do. It's like so people can buy the products on the day. So the products are there, and then everything else sort of fits around the product. Fine. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, Ted, I'd love to talk a little bit about, uh, I'd love to hear you actually talk a little <laughs> bit about the work that we've done together uh, and that actually the, the community of Hollywell has been doing to, to bring footfall back and to bring business back. You've worked hand in hand with um, MPs, councillors, community groups to really um, 
think about cash-heavy communities and what it is that's needed to help them as banks close and other headwinds hit the high street. Um, you were a little bit skeptical at first. Mm -hmm. We had many conversations about taking card payments. You know, what's changed, and and what do you think? What do you think that um, policymakers are doing well for communities like Hollywell, and what could they do better? Um. What's, what changed my mind? You've got to keep up with the times, really, haven't you? If you, if you don't, you get left behind. Um, I, I, I saw that and decided to, to jump on board, and, and I'm glad I jumped on board. Um, it, but it came about from a lot of hard work, uh, as you were involved in the beginning. We, we hemorrhaged three banks, three high street banks, within, within three or four months. Uh, with that went all the ATM machines. So we, the, the town was basically left in in limbo. Um, and luckily for us, yourself and, and David Hansen got together and, and come to Hollywell and worked with us. And 80% of the businesses took up. And I didn't want to be that 1% or, or whatever that didn't. Um, and I have to be honest, it's it, it made a difference. It's made a difference to the town. It's, it's not just about getting money or, or making money. It's about creating, especially in, in my town, a, a, a community spirited feeling. And, that, and that's what happened. Um, as far as local governments, I'm in local government myself, you know, you're already aware. Um, hand on heart, they want to do well, um, but I think they're targeting the wrong area. They want to try and help small businesses. Um, I strongly believe and always have done that it's not about helping strong small businesses, it's about increasing footfall. I think mean, once you increase the footfall for the town, the small business will thrive itself. And so the policies should be, how do we increase the footfall? What can we create that will attract people to the town centres? And luckily for us, Square is one of them. Hopefully we will continue to be. Um, Helen, uh, um, uh, Caroline and, and Mahawa, I'd love to hear about your experiences in, um, in actually accessing sort of government resources and services as you were setting up. Um, did you find the tools that you need? Did you find the support that you need? Or were there areas that you, you wish that there had been more for you? Um, I think uh, um, for, for, me, for me, for us, as, as French, uh, it's great um, uh, to have the support of such an organization like Enterprise Nation. Um, and as well, this is something um, we, we, for us, it's necessary to, um, to have the advice from professionals. So um, we spent money on an accountant, um, and he provided us advice on these topics. We are not um, experts at all. So um, yeah, so we use, um, we use our an accountant. Um, yeah, he helps us on, on that side, yeah. Um, I initially had help because I went through the job center to get my business started. Um, so I got help up to the point of with the start of loans in terms of access to um, funding, like getting money. And then I got the one year mentoring. But then after that, you're kind of left like to figure it out by yourself, um, which I did a lot of. <laughs> um, in terms of the government, there's, I, don't, I don't know um, really much with the government, like in terms of going back there. So it's just looking at like small organizations. I went through Enterprise Nation. Um, I paid like consultancy. And then eventually I just taught, I didn't get an accountant. I mm -hmm. wish I had, I really taught myself everything. Like I thought I need to figure this out. Even if I was gonna pay an accountant, <laughs> I need to know what those profit and loss and all those like jargons mean. So I went through the task of teaching myself firstly. Um, and then out of that, my love for it grew. So then I just started offering it to other people and found like a income, separate income stream to, to pay for. So yeah. So, yeah. Excellent. Um, I've got a couple more questions and then we're going to open it up to the audience for questions. So uh, please get them ready. Um, you know, you were talking about teaching yourself everything about doing your business. This is sort of for all of you. Uh, you had to make a lot of decisions in setting up your business. Um, Ted, I think we know how, how you came to Square, mostly because I chased you around Hollywell until you signed <laughs> up. Um, but I'd love to hear from both of you, you know, why did you choose Square and kind of how has Square helped you uh, as you've been using it? Um, I met Square when I did Enterprise Nation Beauty Exchange. Um, so that's where I met them, yeah. Um, at first I was like, this is another dodgy company trying to get to take my money. <laughs> I <laughs> think I was speaking yeah, at that one. one. Oh, God. <laughs> trying to get me to like come up with these, because I was using Izetto at the time and the 
fees were like, it, it was just too much. I was just thinking, here we go. And I, like, <laughs> so sorry. And I remember, and then they were like, oh, it's free. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I took the card reader. I think it took me like, I was like, what? I just left it actually for a while. And then I finally, I think I had an event and I was like, oh, I've got this new square thing. Let me like try and set it up. And then I set it up and the charges were good. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, okay, I'm getting, I'm seeing my money. Yeah. And then I saw the charge. I thought, 96 feet, that's not bad. Um, and then from there, like, I just kept taking it out all the time. And then when people came to my house and my friends and family, when they did want to buy, they like, oh, well, you got a card. I got my square. So I started making sales in my house as well. So it kind of goes along with me everywhere now. Um, but it did help me, like, really bit lower mm -hmm. so I was able to see my because I'm not selling like two three hundred pound products my products are five six pound so if you're taking a 2.7 percent um transaction fee by the time it hits my bank account I've probably made yeah it, it yeah. did help yeah in terms of my sales so yeah. And Caroline? Yeah, we discovered as well um, Square at, um, during a, an event organized by Enterprise Nation. We needed uh, something like that because mm. we were planning to do pop-ups. Um, so it was great. Yeah, the first, my first, quest, first question was, is it free? Yeah. It was free, so great. Um, and um, I mean, it's free in a way that uh, when you don't use it, you don't pay. Charge, yeah. So um, this is, um, so we were convinced by that. So. Uh, and since we started our pop-up, we use um, Square, and this is definitely something we needed because um, most of our clients want to pay by card or, um, yeah, with their watch or um, phone. So um, we would lost a lot of sales uh, without uh, this device. Mm -hmm. And uh, the funny thing is that um, a month ago we did a pop-up in an investment bank, and. Uh, three guys from the, the, the product um, uh, development came and said, oh, can we pay by card? Yes, we, you can. So, oh, but this is fantastic. We are trying to develop that for ages and we <laughs> can't. And you are a small company, you use this, this is just great. So they were, they were really impressed, yeah. And also I've been able to, so I didn't know you could link it up to my back end. So I use a manufacturing software as well to obviously manage what I'm doing. And they've got the square link. So when I do make the sales, it goes straight in to the system. Oh, so then, yeah, so it's really nice. So thank you. Fantastic. Last <laughs> question for me, and then opening it up to all of you. Um, one piece of advice for all of the, the, the either business owners or budding business owners in the audience. What's, What's one thing that you wish that you'd known when you started your business? Um, Oh, but that's a good question. Um, we can come back to you. Yeah, you want to. yeah. Ted, do you want to kick us off? Yeah. 27 years old, but wise for your age. Yes, yes, yes. What's the one thing? Uh, not to be naive, I think. Not to, not to be naive and not to be blinkered. Embrace technology. Not all technology is, is, is brilliant, but most of it is. And if it's a benefit, then, then, then go for it. Um, more than something I would know, I'd say something I would have. Um, the right contacts to get uh, retailers and to catch their attention. This is something very challenging, especially in a very competitive market. Um, so yeah, uh, the right contacts. Uh, don't be afraid to start small. I mean, I started in my kitchen, so don't, you know, whipping my soap. So don't be afraid to start with what you have, like, and use it and market it and package it. Um, I started with wrapping them in cling film, and now you know we've got proper packaging and stuff like that. So don't be afraid to start small with what you have. You'll be surprised. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. We've got time for a few questions, so I want to <coughs> open it up for questions that the audience has. Don't be shy. There we go. We've got one here in the middle. There we go. We've got a microphone coming to you. <laughs> Ted, Ted, is it an actual barbershop? It is an actual barbershop, yeah. <laughs> <And> it? <laughs> so, so can you take tips? Do I? Via, via Square. Yeah, so, do, some, some, some do. Some, some still give me the, the pay by Square and still give me the, the, the little tip. Oh, we others, can others say add, add the tip on. So, it's, it's so you can do it in the... I, I, I don't use Square. You can actually do it in Square. You can give yeah, a tip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Do you, do you reckon they leave more digitally? Do I? Sorry, because... Do they leave more of a bigger tip digitally? 
Possibly, yeah, possibly. Maybe, you know, maybe it's embarrassments, I don't know. No, really? Because <laughs> when, when it's cash, it's basically keep the change, isn't it? It's, yeah, yeah. You know, if the, if, if, the, the thing is, my, where I am, the, the, it's, it's, not, it's not London places. I, I charge £6.50 for the haircut. I don't need one. Right. So most, most people, most people will, will give you £7 or, 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 or £8 um, when using a square. Probably they'll, they'll say take £10. So it's, mm. maybe it, it does help you. you know. Cool. Other questions? I'm sure that there's other questions in the audience. Here we go. Hello, my name's Anzo Francis. Um, my question is about scaling up, um, whether you've you know, thought about how you might triple in size or double in size. Um, what would you need to do and would you need external finance to do that or have you been able to generate enough cash perhaps to do that yourselves? Should I start? Start. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I have thought about scaling up every day. Um, you do need finance. Um, so what I started doing very early in the business was I started putting process in the business and just really thinking this business cannot live and die with me. So I just started writing my manuals out, how everything works, how you make every product. Um, yeah, just thinking in that terms of, so that when the money does come, I'm not struggling to do the sort of the back end stuff. Um, but I found that as I was doing that, the business seemed to be growing anyway. So I think I was just always thinking systems and processes. Um, but yeah, I would need external finance to scale up, definitely. Yeah, um, for the moment we are 100% self-funded. Um, it was a choice from the beginning uh, from both of us. We have um, built the business in a way that we don't, um, we, we, we lower our running costs um, or fixed costs. Uh, but this is something uh, we won't be able to do if we really want to scale up. Um, uh, so, uh, but for the moment, we don't need to uh, open our capital. Uh, but we, are, we have margin to grow like that. And then, yeah, we, we, have, we, we will need to open the capital, yeah. I think that that's it for time. So I want to say a big thank you again to our Square Sellers for being here. And I hope you'll all join us down at the reception afterwards where you can ask them additional questions. So thank you so much. Lovely, uh, beautiful panel. Um, I should uh, stipulate that we must try harder at Enterprise Nation events to not make Square appear as a dodgy company. <laughs> Absolutely love that phrase. Um, there was a wonderful moment um, just kind of back here just before we started where um, the founder of this great company met these sellers. And the sellers came in and they said, hi, this is what I sell. I'm one of your Square merchants. And the founder of the company immediately said uh, to the sellers, what can we do better? tell me what we can do better in this business. And I just thought, whatever stage of business you're at, that is a great first question to pose. Uh, he is a great entrepreneur. Uh, I think his visit was more hotly anticipated than President Trump's, who has since recently departed our country. Uh, but I am very happy to welcome, and please join me in welcoming to the stage, the excellent Mr. Jack Dorsey. So, welcome to London, Jack. Thank you. How does it feel? Uh, I just got here. feels great so far. This chair really goes back. I was going to say, I, I was. <laughs> are, we, are we having a relaxing conversation? I, am. <laughs> I don't know about you. Uh, I'm going to pose some questions to Jack for about the next 25 minutes, and then we will open up to the floor so you can pose some too. But, um, Jack, I really want to talk to you tonight about the beginnings of Square and where you're looking to take it. So kind of let's rewind to 2009, which is when you started the company. And of course, we've just heard from all these sellers in terms of how Square has benefited their business. But what first gave you the idea to start the company? Um, well, I, um, we, we were actually solving my, my co-founder's problem. My co-founder is uh, Jim McKelvey. He was my second boss um, growing up. Uh, my first boss was my mom. And she she ran a coffee store, and um, she uh, she only hired her kids. And I was 14 at the time. She did not give me the role of CEO. <laughs> she didn't trust me, so you're way ahead of me. Um, 
I don't know what I would have done with that power, but it probably wouldn't have been good. Um, but uh, so my second boss, Jim, when I was 15 years old, we, uh, we just loved working together. And uh, back in the end of 2008, 2009, we decided we wanted to work together again. He had gone from starting companies to being a glass artist. And he, um, he called me in frustration one day, February in 2009, and he said, uh, I know what we need to work on. And I said, what? And he said, well, I just lost a sale on my glass art because I couldn't accept this, this guy's credit card. He wanted, to buy the, he wanted to buy my art, but I couldn't accept the credit card, and now I'm, now I'm out. Um, and for, uh, for a lot of artists, that, that uh, means staying with art or choosing a, a different direction or having to do something you may not want to do. So it seemed like an interesting problem. It seemed like a real challenge because we knew nothing about the credit card industry. We were both in credit card debt at the time. We we didn't know anything about building hardware. We knew nothing about Visa and MasterCard and all these new entities that we had to deal with. So we gave ourselves a month. We decided that we should try to build whatever we could within that month. And at the end of the month, we actually built something that worked. It was ugly. It barely worked, but it worked. And it felt really good, and it felt magical. And we decided to show it s to some other people, and it, it felt magical to them as well. And just on that, so you say we knew nothing about the industry, Visa, MasterCard, etc. Do you sometimes think that ignorance can be bliss when starting out? Uh, well, it's definitely harder because you have to push yourself into some things that are really uncomfortable. For instance, we had to read 700 pages of the Visa operating rules, and this is the most dry reading you, you can imagine. And um, it was, it was Have really you read Article 50 of our withdrawal agreement? <laughs> Uh, no, <laughs> no, I have not. Um, but it it was um, so that was that was challenging. But you know, we didn't really hire anyone who had ever had experience with finance, or worked in the financial industry until about employee fifty. And I do believe um, there is some benefit to not knowing what you're doing because we have no constraint in our creativity, and we kind of approach the problem in the way that we wanted to use. Um, credit cards and the financial system and we got a lot of no's back then but we we showed them the system that was so simple and so approachable and so intuitive and again just felt like magic every time we swiped someone's card in this little reader connected to an iphone people said wow how did you do that and did you actually take my money off my card <laughs> and we said yes and um so it just felt really magical and it it got people's imaginations going and and i think um you know, if you're if you're approaching a problem in that light, where you know you're enabling them to finish a story, you're telling the very start of the story, the the, the preface maybe, and they look at it and they experience it and they say, "Wow, like I could use this. I'm a babysitter, or I'm a massage therapist, or I cut hair, or I'm thinking about opening a coffee store, and I never really considered even accepting credit cards in the first place. But this looks super simple. Is it?" And um, and that's what that's what drove us. So getting people's imaginations going, letting them finish the sentence, um, inspired us, but also kind of inspired the industry that we had to work in to help us solve the problems along with us. And there were many problems that we were, we were about to face. And um, I do like it. I've heard you speak before that. Um, you make it sound all so straightforward. And I know you have just oh, reference problems and we'll come back to them. But the thing that's interesting about Square is your previous businesses and your kind of entrepreneurial ventures have been very software based. So you had coded, you had sold things in the cloud and kind of internet related. This was your first time you were actually making something. How did you figure out how to go about doing that? The production, the logistics, health and safety, how did you even start to go about it? Um, <coughs> the, the definition of entrepreneur to me, and I never wanted to be an entrepreneur, I never wanted to start a business, I never wanted to be a CEO. Um, I wanted to work on things that I loved and things that would teach me. And so I'm always looking for opportunities to go into a new area that would teach me something new, interesting, useful that I could uh, utilize to give back. Um, and uh, hardware was, was that for me. And, and the definition of entrepreneur that I, that I love is 
someone who does whatever it takes to make it work, and usually at significant sacrifice, and usually that sacrifice is financial. So that spirit has really been the success of my career. And I'm not, you know, I, I taught myself how to program, but I would not consider myself an engineer. I'm, I'm not the person to make the thing scale and stand up. I'm the person to figure out the gaps and figure out the next thing that I don't know so I can make the thing work and I can demonstrate it to someone else to potentially inspire them to help me and work with me or to inspire someone who uh, would want to use it. So my, my whole career has just been having you know, some small idea and starting small and um, then pushing myself to learn whatever the next thing is, not learn everything, but whatever the next thing is to make the next thing work and the next thing work and the next thing work and the next thing work. And um, not only did I do that with programming, but it, you know, eventually that translated into, well, if I really want to build this thing, then I'm gonna need help. And if I, the only way for me to get help is to convince people to work 100% of their time with me and that means they would have to leave their job that they're currently doing, which means that I have to pay them. And that means I need to have money, and that means I need to raise money, and if I raise money, I need to put it somewhere. That means we need to create a corporation. So these things just one after another, and it just builds and builds and builds and scales. And uh, every step along the way, um, you learn something new. So hardware was, was like that. We knew nothing. We learned how to solder. We learned the base circuitry. We learned this, this was a very unique project because we, we had to figure out how to get a credit card into an iPhone. And uh, originally you thought, well, what if you just take a picture of it and you OCR it, you op op optical character recognition. And um, we thought, well, that'd be a, re a really weird experience. You wanna buy coffee? Let me take a picture of your credit card. So the interesting thing that we discovered was the iPhone had an audio jack, but the audio jack was also a microphone jack as well. And on the back of every credit card in the United States was a magnetic strip. And how many of you all remember cassette tapes? So that's the same technology. So on the back of a credit card, that magnetic strip is actually an audio track. It is the most unpleasant audio you've ever heard. It sounds like a squirrel screaming. <laughs> but if you know what you're doing, then you can decode that screaming into a series of numbers and that series of numbers happens to be the credit card and you send those series of numbers up um, to the financial networks and they come back with this card has money on it and you can charge it. So um, we, we learned how to read uh, cassette tape and then we learned how to translate that into a digital form that we could send through the audio jack, and then we learned how to decode it and then send it up to the, the financial networks. Nice, simple, love that. Simple, <laughs> this is what I mean, he makes it sound so easy. Uh, we're gonna come back onto people in a minute because I want to ask you about once you've hired people, how you keep them, but kind of move ahead a little bit to then coming into the UK. So Square came into the UK in 2017, thank you very much. Um, just your reflections on entrepreneurship here kind of versus the US. So I guess previously we would always look to America a decade ago and we would say, oh my goodness, what an entrepreneurial country it is. So many people starting amazing businesses, but hopefully you've seen that the UK is kind of catching up. But your reflections as a US entrepreneur in terms of Square sort of introducing and coming to the market here. Well, I, I, I think the special thing about, um, at least within San Francisco and Silicon Valley, was that um, there was a very, very high tolerance for mistakes and failure, and there was a support network. So if you started a company and you failed, it wasn't a permanent mark against your reputation and that you could never do it again. Um, people were willing to invest in you and invest in a first idea and then be patient enough that you might have to pivot that to something else or you might have to shut it down and if you shut it down you come back with a better idea, they would fund you again. And as I've traveled around the world and talked to entrepreneurs, I think that has been the historical lacking factor within a bunch of countries is that there's a very low tolerance for mistakes and, and for failure. And especially when it comes to investors, the VCs, the angel investors, 
um, when you make a mistake, when your business fails, they kind of write you off for the rest of your life. And that, that just do, that didn't exist in America. And um, I, I think that that capacity to be able to make mistakes, to be able to be open about them, to share them with people who who have also made mistakes. And like I, I started a, I started a company. My first company in San Francisco completely failed. We had to give all the money back to the investors, and it was most it was extremely embarrassing and felt terrible. But we bounced back, and people that we met again just kind of erased their memory of that failure and and looked at the merit of the idea and, and trusted that we were thinking about it the right way. We're testing to see if we learned anything in the process and I learned anything in the process. And um, and that just made it um, that made it possible. So I think um, I think at least in the UK and London that has changed. That that um, tolerance for failure and and for mistakes is is much much uh, much higher, um, and that's great. Uh, I was just in Paris, and I also met with a bunch of entrepreneurs, and I, I think there is still low tolerance for for failure and mistakes, and um, I, I think that is changing, and we see line of sight to it. But that to me is a necessary condition to do anything really amazing because we have to experiment, we have to be able to fail, we have to be able to make mistakes, and we have to be encouraged to learn from those mistakes most importantly. If we just make mistakes and we go about our day and, and, and don't acknowledge them and address them, then nothing really changes. So it, it comes with this sense of growth mindset. I'm going to learn from what I screwed up and I'm going to apply those learnings in uh, a new way as I think about starting something else. Uh, it's really interesting you say this, and sorry to keep on going on about newspapers, but I do think media has got quite a pivotal role to play in this. And anyone who read the Sunday Times, and Peter Evans is sitting right there, there was a big piece from a big entrepreneur we have here called Luke Johnson, and he recently had a big failure, a very public failure of a bakery shop called Patisserie Valerie. And there was a massive piece yesterday of him essentially publicly saying, I failed, but I'm coming back, and he's going to be writing a weekly column again. So I thought that was really interesting, and hopefully that is a step further to the UK being a bit more accepting of failure. But just back to people. So you've just mentioned, um, and I love again, this kind of l logic of thought that I need to hire people and therefore I need to pay them, so I need to raise money. Once you've hired people, and both in both of your businesses, Square and Twitter, once you've hired people, how do you go about advice for any of our businesses who are thinking, I've made two hires, I want to grow a team that's bigger, your thoughts on then how to keep people motivated and keep them in the business, and keep them performing in the business? Um, <clears throat> well, I think the most impactful thing is um, people motivate themselves. So I think we have to recognize that first and foremost, and, and people motivate themselves by a sense of purpose. Um, and I like to think that um, everyone in our company is serving and works for the purpose, not another human in the company, but actually works for the purpose. And our job as leaders in the company is to point the finger back to the purpose and remind ourselves of why we're here in the first place. And if you're not motivated by the purpose of the company, then you shouldn't be there. It's not good for the company, it's not good for you. So you should just recognize it and go separate ways. So the first thing I do in any interview is ask, um, why Square? And it's a very open-ended question. And some people say, well, you know, this looks like a rocket ship and it looks like you're all doing very well and it seems very successful and I want to join a successful company. That is a person I do not want to hire. Some people say, well, my mom used to own a salon and she had so many problems dealing with the financial industry and she couldn't even start accepting credit cards in the first place because they denied her because she had terrible credit. They didn't even give her a chance. And you seem to be fixing her problem if she had what you're uh, producing. They get hired. We, they get hired. But, but also then more people, th then there's some people say, and you're doing all these great things, but you're doing this and this and this wrong. And here's how I can help fix it. They don't get hired. They do get hired. No, they Kidding. do get they do get hired because I, I wanna I wanna see that they're already thinking about solutions and already trying to solve problems. I mean, at its very core, every business is very simple. Its only existence is to solve a problem. And uh, a, a business becomes great or successful if it solves a problem in a unique way that is differentiated from all the other folks that have solved the problem before. So 
like the the real task, the real skill in any business is to get really, really good at solving problems, recognizing problems, breaking problems into smaller parts, asking essential questions, and then coming up with really creative solutions that move the industry or move the uh, space or society forward in some way. And I know you're a big supporter of Clay Christensen, who has written a great yeah, book about he's this. Amazing. Yes. Jobs to be done. Well, in fact, it was from hearing you that I bought that book, and it is a brilliant book around exactly what you've just said. A uh, slightly different tact, uh, which is still a square activity, but a transaction you made last year. Uh, so you acquired Weebly. And I'm quite interested in this from you are a maker of things. You talk about your three values being simplicity, constraint, and craftsmanship. So you're known to make things. So I would have thought Square would have made its own websites, but instead you acquired Weebly, who make websites. What was the thinking behind the acquisition? Well, sometimes other people make it better than you. Um, and you just need to recognize that. And uh, we need to acknowledge when, when someone else uh, has done something pretty phenomenal and, um, and, uh, and, and go after it. So uh, we, we found some really great entrepreneurs in, in Weebly and uh, a great team and technology focused. And they really resonated with, with us. Uh, we had an alignment of purpose. Um, and we just, we just kind of clicked. And um, they, uh, they'd been doing this for quite some time. And we could certainly do it, but um, it would it would probably be subpar to what they what they had already offered. So, just being able to admit that you know other people have achieved mastery in a way that might take you years or you might not ever reach is important. And that's important certainly in acquiring things, but also hiring people as well. Like I, I don't want to hire anyone that I wouldn't learn from, and that wouldn't make me better and challenge me in 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 some way in some dynamic. Um, so. Uh, being able to recognize that and admit it and then fill the gaps. It's all about filling, the, like recognizing the gaps and filling the gaps. Um, we're going to come on to High Street because I know there's some people here tonight who are very interested in it. Is David here and can he click us on to a lovely slide that shows the Clicks and Mortar shop? So if we can show it, this is the shop um, that we opened in partnership with Square. Um, can we see the shop? I think it just involves clicking a slide. <laughs> Which, which feels like an odd thing to say when you're sitting next to a major technology entrepreneur. It might be going backwards because oh, they, they put it up when you were talking. Oh, really? Anyway, imagine a beautiful shop. <laughs> uh, so we opened a shop on Monday called Clicks and Mortar uh, in Manchester. It's filled with online sellers who 10 traders come in and they trade at the same time. And therefore, we're making kind of the rent accessible for each small business to pay. Uh, you come from a high street background, as you say, your mum had a coffee shop. What impact would you like to see Square having on high streets? I know uh, in the US you've got issues with your malls closing down because kind of people are moving out. What's the impact you'd love to see Square having on this part of the economy? Well, I, I mean, we talk a lot about starting small businesses, but I think the real challenge is um, keeping small businesses in business. Um, and, you know, my, my mom, is a is an interesting case because she opened a coffee store with a sole purpose of bringing her community together in St. Louis, Missouri, where I'm from. And she didn't want to grow. She didn't want to hire anyone besides me and my my younger brothers. Um, I would always ask her the question, like, why can't we open a new location? We're doing quite well. Why can't we hire someone um, that's not in our family? Um, <laughs> and 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 she just flat out said, that's not what I want. Like my whole goal here is to stay small and to I'm happy when people come into my store and they talk and um, and St. Louis is a, a very segregated city and we always lived right in the middle of the city and it's where the city really came together and my mom's coffee store was one of those places where the city kind of met itself um, and uh, and she she just loved it and she didn't want to compete with the Starbucks of the world and I think the most interesting thing about Technology these days is you get to choose to stay small but still have a potential global impact or global footprint. You can you can do a lot more with a lot less because of technology, and um, but you could also have an aspiration to be all over the world and um, be like Starbucks and put you know a location on every single block of every single city in the world. 
Um, so it's it's really a question of what your ambition is and what what your goal is. And um, I think uh, our our job is certainly to to help people um, to grow, but but just staying in business is is a challenge. And uh, we recognize the most critical need was this shift away from paper money to credit cards and accepting credit cards being quite challenging and a lot of people just weren't getting through the system or weren't even uh, enabled uh, into to participate in the system at all. So we made what we thought was a very simple solution to at least get them there and then we recognized the next most critical need and the next most critical need and you know arrived at something like Square Capital where they you know, in the U.S., our average transaction size for our lending product where we're loaning people money is about $6,000, $7,000. And there's no bank in the United States that can make money under $10,000. So they don't give loans under $10,000. And for a, for, a, for a small business to go to a bank and uh, only, only be able to get $10,000 or, in the worst case, $25,000, that's a lot of debt and that's a lot of money. And they just don't need it. So... We offered a product that um, would give them six thousand dollars, or five thousand dollars, or three thousand dollars. And uh, what's interesting about that is we're not really competing with banks in that product. We're competing with them going to their friends or their family to borrow some money to buy a new salon chair, or to hire someone, or to do some new marketing. So it was an entirely new market that became a lot more accessible, and it it was purely a function of just applying technology in a smarter way. Um, and pushing, you know, our uh, banking partners and our um, and their regulators to think a little bit differently, under the under this uh, spirit of enabling more people to participate in the economy. So it all comes back to that purpose of economic empowerment. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think any solution that we build needs to first help the business stay in business. Um, and uh, eventually help them grow. And I love our business model at Square because it's very, very simple. All we have to do on the seller side is just help the seller make the sale. And if they make the sale, they have a high probability of growing. And if they grow, we grow. And if we grow, then we can help more sellers make sales. So we have a complete alignment of interest. Um, there's, there's no tax in the system. So it's, um, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a business model that we're very fortunate to have and when we want to continue to... Well, I was going to say, and what are your growth plans? So could you see um, Jack Ma, who runs Alibaba, talks about this kind of world of global e-commerce where small businesses are trading. And again, I'm sorry to bring it back to the politics of this country, but uh, we did a trade deal with South Korea this morning. Did you see that? Anyway, I tweeted out at like 6 a.m. because it was announced that we've just done a trade deal with South Korea and somebody replied saying, oh, that's Brexit fixed then. <laughs> I think they were being ironic. Um, but we're out uh, doing trade deals across the world, hoping to remain a great trading nation, even though we're an island, so we're kind of still saying, let's look outwards. Could you ever see Square, because you just said there's no tax in the system, could we ever, because actually, again, just as a final political thing, one of our contenders for prime minister, a guy called Michael Gove, um, oh God, there was almost, I don't know whether that was a guffaw or a cheer. <laughs> Uh, for him, but one of the things he said is he would scrap VAT, which is one of our taxes, and all he'd have is a sales tax. And every time we look at this, we think Square would be in an amazing position because if small businesses are making sales, you would see the data and the transaction data. Therefore, could some kind of levy be applied to that? So I guess back to the question, do you see Square as enabling global commerce? And in a way, what role do you want to play in that? Well. I mean, it's definitely an aspiration to, to help stimulate global commerce. And we want to start with, you know, our, our businesses. So, like, how do, we, how do we enable a small seller to participate uh, globally? Um, and and that, that is first. And I think in a lot of the conversations that happen within the government and regulation, the small business is often forgotten, even though if you consider almost any country in the world, um, the small business economy is the dominant economy. It is driving the most of it. But a lot of small businesses have trouble staying in business. So it's it's a lot of turnover, but they're still driving over 50% of the economy usually. And um, so, so that's goal number one, is to make sure that we are bringing them back up in the conversation because while we're, while we're considering 
deals with other nations, we're not really supporting the businesses that make it even possible to consider those deals in the first place. So um, I, I, I would love to see more of a focus on like what a small business needs in order to start to stay in business even before taxes. Um, there's a question of like the permitting process and the, the local regulation just to get a business started within the city. It's, uh, it's a bit of a maze, it's extremely complicated. You get to the end of the process and you feel like, does this city really want me to be in business? Because I had to go through so much just to start and I have to go to even more to expand. So does the city even want me? Um, and we need to fix that. We need to streamline that and make it much easier. So there's a bunch of friction we can remove from the system that would enable people to build much faster. And if you have more people building, you have more experiments and that'll lead to um, much faster innovation uh, throughout uh, any country and, and around the world. And final question before we open up to the floor. You mentioned cities and um, businesses thinking, does this city want me? You have been quoted as saying you would quite like the job of New York City Mayor. You've said it would be a new bar and aspiration for you. A, do you still want the job? B, do you want the job of British Prime Minister? <laughs> and I guess C, what would you do if you had either of those jobs? Well, for, for either of those jobs, I think I would have to change my whole outfit and I would not want to do that. So. <laughs> have to actually dress up. Um, but I, when, I, when I was a kid, I, I was just obsessed with cities and how they worked, and I, I felt like the mayor was a great uh, view into a city hunt and how it worked. But I was um, at one point deciding between political science and computer science, and I had, some, I had a realization early on that if I got into politics, I could propose um, a law and change some regulation and I might see the outcome within three to five years, but um, I could write some code and I could simulate um, outcomes and I could see the result within eight seconds. Mm -hmm. And it just uh, it felt so powerful in terms of being able to influence um, what is possible and what we could do and what we could build that I chose the, f the faster path of, um, of uh, of engineering and, and computer science because um, I, I just felt I could learn so much more from it. And um, I, I think, you know, the, 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 mir the, um, the partnership between um, government, between civil society, and between platforms and technology companies, I think is still quite weak. But when we actually can collaborate more, it, it can be quite powerful and quite positive. So um, I, right now, what I'm seeking to do is like, how do we get closer to civil society? And through civil society, how do we get closer to government so that we can actually be in sync instead of this adversarial relationship that we find ourselves in today? Uh, which could be a whole other discussion in its own right, because we are in very interesting territory uh, from that point of view. Uh, questions for Jack, are you happy to take questions? Yeah, of course. Uh, questions from our audience. Yes, lady at the back was straight up there with her hand. You can either shout or wait for the microphone. Can you stand? Because we might hear you a little better. Oh, there we go. Um, so my name's Tammy. Um, I'm actually um, a network marketer. So I work with a company called Arbon, And it's kind of my side hustle at the moment. But I want to um, grow that over time. You've said you like to learn a lot. And I do an awful lot of personal development. So I wondered if you could recommend any good audios, um, podcasts, or a book that you've really loved through your entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, I, I think back to that. Um Back to that realization of um, really what the core of a business is, is um, solving problems. So to me, the skill that one uh, wants to develop um, to get good at that is critical thinking. Um, this is, a, you know, d d there's a whole bunch of works and books and podcasts around how to become better at critical thinking how to become better at asking essential questions, how to become better at breaking problems into smaller parts so you can, you can solve them. The, the, greatest, um, the greatest thing I learned from teaching myself how to program was not becoming an engineer. That was, that was the outcome that I thought I should be driving towards, but it's, it's not the most impactful thing that, that actually helped me. The greatest thing I learned from learning how to program is how to solve problems. 
how to break problems down into smaller parts. It's an amazing way to consider problems and building solutions against those problems. And you can do this with math mathematics and you can do this with uh, logic courses, but I, I guess I would encourage um, you to consider um, you know, text and audiobooks and podcasts around problem solving and getting better at solving problems. And there's one book I really like, it's a very short book, it's called Asking Essential Questions. Um, and uh, it's, um, it just goes through a bunch of uh, fields of study and, and just example questions and why that question might be a great question to get to uh, in understanding the problem or a solution or why it might be a terrible question forcing a particular solution or a particular problem. So if I were to master one thing, and this is I, I, I continue to work on this to this day, it's how do I get better at solving problems? How do I get better at asking questions that um, provide insight into the problems that I'm trying to solve? So this sh should be the goal of any liberal arts education is just pure critical thinking and problem solving, but I, I feel like we have um, lost some of that because we're, we're talking about things like entrepreneurship, which kind of is an abstraction on the thing you actually need to do or we're talking about uh, building businesses or um, the outcomes of programming, which again is an abstraction on the real skill that you need to build, which is problem solving. Yes. Entrepreneurship is an abstraction, love that. Question here, the lady with the blue top. That's it. Hello, I'm a nutritional therapist and I came into this because I had a burnout and I worked in a different industry. I'm really interested in um, people like you and, you know, um, in, in, in the sector you're in, um, about how you all keep yourselves healthy and you as the boss, what are you doing to kind of encourage, you know, your, your people and your team to stay healthy, you know, in mind and body and, and um, have some kind of balance in life and be really successful in business too? Well, well first I'll, I'll, um, I'll add a disclaimer here, which is I am really weird and really strange. And but people are fascinated by this, aren't they? So, as in, if you Google you, there is so much about how you bathe, how you... No, there is a Not lot about, about <laughs> what you eat. There's a lot out there about... People are fascinated by your daily habits. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the reason, the reason I, I'm super weird and strange, and if you, you ask my mom, I've always been like this, but, like, I like experimenting. And I like, you know, I, I think a really good experiment is going to the extremes of things and finding the edges. And when, you find, when you're able to find the edges of something, you can find the balance. Until you find the edges, you can't really find the balance. And I want to know what the edge feels like. And um, so I put myself in really uncomfortable situations as, as much as I can with my diet, with, um, you know, mental practices, with uh, exercise and... Uh, learning and sleep and I, I've gone through every extreme uh, in order to find a balance so what I've learned from that is you know I, I, I do for for 20 years I've done meditation and then two years ago I decided I'm gonna do a 10-day silent meditation retreat and I you know you're not able to speak with anyone you're not able to look anyone in the eye you're not able to read write exercise from 4 30 in the morning until 9 p.m. you meditate you're alone, and you're alone with yourself, and it really teaches you a lot about yourself. It is one of the most challenging things I've ever done, but also the most impactful because it taught me. It taught me how it it taught me clarity, it taught me discipline because being able to focus on one thing uh, all day for ten days um, really trains your mind to focus to uh, to have this amazing sense of discipline. And uh, it, it just gave me this real uh, sense of awareness, self-awareness. Self so I, I really like identifying where I feel that there's a particular gap uh, in what I'm doing. And when, when I, um, you know, I was, I was running Square and I went back to Twitter and suddenly I had these, these, these two jobs and a ton of stress. And that stress pushed me into a bunch of directions. It, it told me that I need to exercise every day physically because otherwise I, I would not be healthy and I need to reconsider how I'm eating because I was eating very poorly and I need to 
have some way to quiet my mind every single day, and that led me to a deeper meditation practice. So this works for me, um, and uh, like I, I think it's it's really just a function of embracing whatever challenges you have, and then um, listening to your intuition and to your body in terms of what it wants to explore, and you'll find something there. And I've always found it fastest and, and probably the best solution for me by just going to the extreme, just like, you know, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this 10-day thing. It's super extreme. I can't talk with anyone, including my coworkers, for 10 days, and all this stuff is going on in the world. But in order me to, for me to function for the 355 days left in the year, I need to take these 10 days um, because it's, it's going to make me stronger and it's going to make me healthier. So um, making that time for myself and, and, there, and thereby everyone I work with was important and I just put it in that perspective. So, um, and then I also realized I wasn't sleeping enough. Like I, I, I try to get eight to nine hours of sleep a night and uh, if I don't, I feel it and I, uh, I feel terrible and it probably affects everyone else around me as well. So just, just you know, trying to build that discipline around what do I need in order to do my job and identifying again the gaps uh, in my life right now and and then for me, I just like going to the extreme and testing some things on myself um, that will help me uh, learn something new about myself. Okay, questions coming in. Um, this gentleman here, Ooh. raising the bar actually, just quickly raising, the, sorry, e.g., just right in front of you, raising the bar. <laughs> then that gentleman. Um, you gotta say it right, Emma. Yep. You gotta say it right. Raising the bar. Thank now you. you're gonna have to explain to Jack what your business is, otherwise <laughs> I just sound like a weirdo. I'll just say it in four words. Corporate team building with sheep. I'll just leave it, I'll just leave it like that. Corporate team building with sheep. <laughs> now, I wanted to thank you first of all, and then I have a question. So I wanted to thank you guys because we are a very small business, but our client base is huge, as in large, large, large companies. And there have been two occasions. One, uh, a very big company beginning with G, which we use every single day, but we're not allowed to say that we work with them. <laughs> and they're in America, and uh, they wanted to buy from us, and they could only pay with a card. So... Thankfully, I could do it because awesome. square with that, <laughs> and uh, and that's happened with in this country as well. So so thank you for that. But I just wondered, in fact, if it was a an area, a market that you were going to pursue a bit more, because I don't know about other people here, but we're obviously not clicks and mortar. We're not. We you know our transactions are thousands rather than um, a few pounds. And so I wondered if it was something you were going to develop more on, because I think there are things that could be improved. Uh, I mean, we've managed it, but I just wondered if it was an area that Square were going to pursue. So helping SMEs to play with the big boys, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we um, when we started the company, we were really focused on independent sole proprietors and people who were just getting started and small businesses. But we realized some way, somewhere along the line that um, we can't just be a company for small businesses, because a lot of small businesses want to grow. And we can't be the company that says, hey, congrats, you've grown, but you've outgrown us, so you gotta go find someone else now. We have to build tools that actually scale with our customers and build with them. And, uh, and over the past five years, we've built tools that, um, you know, now we have the great fortune of, a lot of, our s a lot of our smallest sellers now have grown into much larger sellers, and that makes us really proud, like we've seen businesses go from one location to 30, uh, and, and that's just awesome. So uh, yes, we want to continue to develop uh, up market and make sure that if someone does have the aspiration of, of going broader and getting bigger, that they don't have to think twice about the tool, that they can just keep going and keep building. If, if they ever have to, if any of our customers ever have to think about us, we have failed. Uh, and we need to recognize that and um, uh, correct it. And uh, we, you know, um, we, we want to make sure that we are invisible in this whole thing. Um, one, of the, you know, one of the reasons our, our name is Square is, you know, Square references a table and we want people to put their, bus their business on top of the table, not for the table to be the, the highlight, not, not for our branding to take over their branding. We're, we're the support structure. We should be completely invisible and that's why our brand is so boring but in the best way, in the best boring way. Now in you the, know. In the, in the US, there's a, there's a, a phrase, uh, square up, which means to settle and fair and square. 
which we, we want to bring more fairness to the to the economy and um, it was just a very simple shape to build in hardware. Love it. The simplicity. Always back to the simplicity. I'm very aware we're eating into your glass of wine time, so I am going to ask the final two questions if we just do them together. So this gentleman and then that gentleman. So uh, my name is Eric Davison. Uh, I'm uh, an investor at Hamburg Perks, an early stage VC based in London. Uh, y you were talking about something that really struck a chord with me, and it was around feedback loops in what we do. Um, you said that you know in coding you have very quick feedback loops, so you can test something in eight seconds, and you know versus politics of a few years. Long feedback loops are something that's uh, you know a problem uh, for us in investing. So I, I think I'm a, 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 a pretty young VC for the moment. I think I can get away with saying that. Uh, and I think I'm making great investment decisions, but ultimately I, I don't really know. Uh, and I guess my question for you is, having started a number of you know very successful companies. If you were to be starting a company again now, uh, right now, uh, from scratch, what sectors currently really excite you and where would you think about starting a business? Um, well, I, th I think um, I, this, th this all comes, like it all has to come from a personal place too because what I would expect from our investors is a passion for a purpose as well. Like I, I also ask them the question, why square? And if I didn't hear that they were interested and passionate about our problem space, I didn't want to work with them. Because getting an investor is kind of like having an employee that you can never fire. You can never part ways with them. And um, that could be super annoying or uh, detrimental to the business. So I think, I think you know, you ultimately have to answer this question, but for me, I'm, I'm really fascinated by um, everything that's happening in cryptocurrency um, and a lot of the blockchain startups. Everything that's happening within health um, is, a, is a big one um, that, I'm, that I'm fascinated by. If, if I were to start in another company, it would, it would probably be something in the health space, um, probably be something with, uh, with mental health. Um, and, um, but, uh, you know, it, everything happening within the crypto space is super exciting to me in a um, kind of a, it feels like the early internet, so it brings me back to my childhood. So it just feels fun. Uh, and and I, I love it. I love the community around it. I love how wild it is. I love how wacky and weird it is and how edgy it is. So I would, um, I would definitely uh, look to start something there. But um, if it were... Um, uh, it would be that probably that or health. Um. Nice. You could call that circle. 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 I think I've there's got a, a few companies named Circle. I've got a lovely circle, circle this looks logo really in my head. Are you okay with this? I know. <laughs> <laughs> no one else can see what you're talking you're about. Just Our just amazing photographer is laying photograph. straight on the floor. I feel bad uh, for sir, your neck. Final you question. Need a massage. Hi, um, my name is Sal Essa. I'm the founder of No Gunk. Um, we make all natural grooming products for funky fellas. Um, I, I started uh, my, my business, well, you people like you yourself. Um, <laughs> I, I wish you weren't wearing a hat because then we could see your lovely hair. Um, I'm having a bad hair year, so I'm keeping <laughs> under wraps. Um, I, I started my business actually selling uh, in Old Spitalfields Market in East London, and we did use Square. Um, so that was very good. But now we, we sell around the world uh, direct to consumer in over 23 countries. Um, and one of the things we're really looking for is investment um, to support growth and, as you say, hire people and build it's a, a team. It's a VC right here. I, no, I was actually going to say, Sal, are you doing a pitch right now? I'm, I'm not doing a pitch. <laughs> I'm not doing a pitch. But um, I, I was just wondering, you know, when, when you were looking for investment, because this is something I haven't done before, when you were looking for investment um, for your ventures, how did you find the right partners? Um, because I think what we're looking for is, um, you know, smart money, you know, people who have connections, people who can um, really... Uh, uh, you know, not like a crowdfunding campaign, but people who, who can expedite our growth and, and have experience in doing that. 
Yeah, so I, I, I find that a lot of entrepreneurs I talk to are, are kind of mesmerized by the, by the brands of particular firms. Like there's a firm called Sequoia in the United States, which is, is this premium uh, VC brand. And they, they just get obsessed with, like, if I got money from Sequoia, I've got it made. And when you, when you really look deeply into all these things, um, it, it's really about the, the person within the firm. I could care less about Sequoia. Uh, I think they're okay, but Roloff, who was at Sequoia and currently leads Sequoia, um, is amazing. And he was amazing for us because he was at PayPal, and he was a CFO at PayPal. And he, see, he saw all the things that we were probably about to see. And I really wanted that experience. And I, I really wanted to learn from that experience. You know, to me, it's like all about, like, who am I going to learn from? And Roloff, I could care less about the other partners. I'm sure they're all fine. But Roloff was really interesting. I could care less about the brand. It was all about his experience that I wanted to tap into. So if we were assigned another partner, I would have said no to Sequoia, even if they wanted to invest in the first place. And the, the thing that we did um, when we were pitching Square is we took, we gave it, for our first round, we gave ourselves two weeks and we um, put all the investors and all the firms we didn't want to work with at the beginning. And we put all the folks we did want to work with at the very end. And uh, Roloff and this guy named Vinod from COSA were the two last meetings that we took. And what that allowed us to do is we practiced and we made all of our mistakes with the people that we really did not want to work with. And we didn't care about that. We, we went in, we made our pitch, we made mistakes, and they, they said no or they said yes. And we're like, oh, we, don't, we don't want to work with you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end, we had perfected our pitch. We learned all the questions. We put those in the deck. And we did all that stuff. And then the other thing that we did I, that, that I think helped us a lot is we had one slide which listed 140 reasons why this Y square would fail. And then we took nine of those and we went down each one and we said how we're thinking about ways to mitigate that failure. Because what we wanted to do is we wanted to show like, hey, there's a lot of variables that could go wrong here and you might be making the stupidest investment of your life. So just consider all these. And then we're going to we're going to go through all the ones that we think um, are likely to happen, but we have answers to, uh, just to show how we're thinking about dealing with challenges, dealing with failure, and dealing with uh, risk, and and um, and that worked extremely well. Like a lot of the VCs we talked to had never seen anyone come in and say, "Hey, we're going to fail," um, and here's all the reasons why we might fail. Um, and it, it just kind of disarmed the conversation. And in some of those meetings, they started answering the questions for us, like, well, you could do this to prevent this sort of failure. And we're like, oh, that's a good idea. We haven't thought about that. <laughs> um, and we put that in the deck for the next person. <laughs> so um, it, 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 was just a, it was just a function of, like, identify the people that are really passionate about your problem space. You can do this through research. A bunch of these folks have bios and Wikipedia. Some of them have published papers or former careers that you can read about. And you know, research that and study that, and then do whatever it takes to get in front of them. Um, but do so after you've practiced a bit and pushed yourself a bit um, so that you can you know, really have a fruitful conversation where you're showing uh, a, a deep understanding, good grasp of the problem space and, and the work. Um, so. That that was that was our approach. We we you know like just identify the people who you could as, you could see as your mentor, um, but it's a mentor that also happens to be giving you, hopefully, lots of money. <laughs> a mentor plus money. Uh, Jack Dorsey. There are sellers to meet downstairs. There is wine to drink. Uh, we have overrun by twenty five minutes. We could oh, have gone on for sorry. much more. Um, I wanted to give you a little gift. I don't know if everyone can see this. Oh. Have, are we the first people Just ever to have I done need. this? Yes, you are the first. <laughs> are we really? Just what I need. So uh, Jack now has his own beautiful beaded uh, branded beanie, which I'm hoping he's going to be wearing across the rest of his tour across the rest of the world. Thank you. And sharing with his 4.9 million Twitter followers. Uh, you have been wonderful. So uh, this man is... Um, 
has to be very careful with his time. He's given it graciously to us this evening, covering everything from raising money to accepting failure to where Square goes next. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking the excellent one and only Jack Dorsey. Thank you so much. Thank you.